This message, I believe, is going to be like that quintessential, uh, put it in the archives, historic message about how to hear the voice of God. As a matter of fact, if you're taking notes uh, while you're watching online, you can jot these notes down. I'm actually going to give you the 10 ways that you can hear God's voice, the 10 ways that you can ensure that you hear God's voice. And I'm just believing that you're shouting me down through that screen right now. I'm believing that you are um, just having an experience, not just with my voice, but the voice of the Lord is going to speak to you even during this message. So uh, just go ahead and write this down. This is number one. The number one way to hear the voice of God is to realize that you were created, you were born for relationship with him. Like you've got to go back. I, the number one question I get from people is, Pastor Mike, why am I alive? What is the purpose of my existence? Well, according to the book of Genesis, God said, man, everything I've created is good, but it's missing something. It's missing someone for me to be in relationship with. And so the lowest common denominator for why you are on planet Earth, please hear me, is because God designed you for relationship with him. And we mess that up. We always think that we're human doers, not human beers, right? Like we're, we're here to be human beings and we're stuck so much in what we do, validating our identity that we forget that we're supposed to be with God, right? And so number one is this, realize that you were born for a relationship with God. It's your primary reason that you were created. Um, number two is this. And now it's kind of like going in a sequential order on purpose. You cannot fully realize number one until you get a heart check for number two, okay? So number two is this. In order to hear God's voice clearly, please, by all means, check your heart as to your motive behind hearing his voice. So what is the true motive that you have for hearing his voice? that this is gonna be like a difficult thing to weigh out and only you can, can do this. And this might be like a convicting point like really early on, but hear what Proverbs chapter 21 verse two says. It says this, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. So everything we think we do is right in our own eyes, but watch this, the Lord weighs the heart. And then in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says this, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, just to be entrusted with the, with the message, so we speak, but not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So there's this connection between what we do and then us being trusted on a heart level by God. And unfortunately, so many of us lack a true understanding of what our, our identity is. And so we say, wait a second, and this is how you see certain people in the Christian community, the Christian world, is they're like, maybe if I can hear the voice of God, it will give me this identity. I, I can be this sort of like spiritually powerful person. And they put so much stock in being this person who hears God that they miss the revelation that they're supposed to be a person who's loved by God and with God. And, 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 and then sometimes it becomes so difficult to actually like convince convince people that there's weight behind your words so that you put this little tag on the end, thus saith the Lord. And you say, well, what I lack in my own authority, I'll make it up with God's. And what I lack in my own ability to convince you, well, maybe if I can say God's saying it, that'll convince you. And so I really cannot emphasize enough, you are actually distancing yourself from your ability to hear from God when you speak on God's behalf. <laughs> It's like when you make stuff up and say, well, God said this, but it's because of character flaw. Maybe it's something in your own personal life that you're just like, I'm too afraid to tell people how I really feel that I've got to say God said it. That character flaw needs to be dealt with because God weighs the heart and he'll say, hey, remember when you were on planet Earth and you were super scared to go back to that place that those people annoyed you or bothered you and confront them with their behavior and say it was something that you needed to talk to them about and you made it up like it was me saying it, that was messed up. <laughs> and so what I try to ask myself all the time is essentially why am I going to say God said this? 
And then that motive reveals whether or not God is truly saying it or it reveals a character flaw that I have that I need to be saying, you know what, Mike, I know you're introverted. I know that you hate confrontation, but please do not hyper-spiritualize this because you're gonna go from a prophet, right? And, and, you know, and you're gonna downgrade yourself um, to just like somebody who doesn't get God. So number, t- number three is this, readjust your expectation. Don't just expect to hear from God. And I know you're probably like, what? Like, how am I listening to a message right now (laughs) about how to hear God's voice, but you're telling me don't expect to hear it? Well, let me just kind of like explain that to you. First Kings chapter 19, verse 11 is like the quintessential message about hearing the voice of God. Many of you probably already know it. There's a man, his name was Elijah and he was a prophet. And actually the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm getting ready to talk. So prepare yourself to hear my voice. And then he walks outside to prepare himself. And then you famously have first the wind that begins to move and he's trying to hear God's voice in the midst of the wind and he's not hearing it because God's not speaking through the wind. And then there's this earthquake. And and as he's experiencing all this shaking, he's like, okay, surely this mighty God is going to speak through such a phenomenon as an earthquake, and yet he doesn't hear God's voice. And then lastly, there's this fire, and and surely God is in the midst of all this physical manifestation of fire. He's going to speak, and, and he doesn't hear him. And then after all that settles, he hears this still, small voice from God. And I think that that was necessary training in Elijah's life because he had connected God's voice to emotional experiences. He had connected God's voice to theatrics, like the theatrics of wind, the theatrics of an earthquake, the theatrics of fire, and he had to distance himself. Some of you guys right now are getting a revelation that you've connected hearing God's voice to the theatrics of a worship experience. That's the wind. Oh man, when they hit the right note and they're singing, when, 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 the, when the bass kicks just right and the drummers build in the song, then I encounter God's presence and I hear his voice. And God will sometimes, in his mercy, he'll grace you with you having those experiences in the beginning. But as he brings you into a maturity, all of a sudden, sometimes he will separate his voice from the theatrics and say, hey, hey I kind of hooked you in with some crazy experiences, but now I actually want to develop a relationship with you. Like, like, hey, I took you on some really awesome dates. Remember that time at V1 Church during worship and you started crying? That was me dating you. But now I want to marry you and we're going to have to learn how to do breakfast together, not just dinner. Like, like now this isn't going to just be this crazy theatrical experience. Like, I want to actually know you. And so what Elijah was experiencing was this still small voice of God. So adjust your expectation. Man, I feel like I'm getting something out of this. (laughs) Um, Okay, number four is this. Sharpen your hearing with humility. Sharpen your hearing with humility. Philippians chapter two, verse three. So Philippians chapter two, verse three says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So you're asking your question like, how do I hear the voice of God? Like, what do I do to hear his voice? Well, I'll tell you this. The fastest way to silence his voice in your life is to do things out of selfish ambition. Like that, that right there is, so here's the wisdom key. And this is probably one of my favorite lines from this message today. Here it is. You'll hear God's voice most clearly when you're trying to hear it for someone else. Like you will hear God's voice most clearly when you try to hear it for somebody else. As a matter of fact, you're probably listening to this message right now because someone shared it with you because you want to hear God's voice for yourself. And and I'm here to tell you the the way you're going to hear it most clearly is when you start trying to hear his voice for someone else. Because selfish ambition is, God, speak to me to help me. In other words, how can I get to a destination without you, God, and all these people currently in my life that I can't stand? But where you go, there you are. (laughs) And so God is trying to teach you to hear his voice clearly on behalf of somebody else. Um, Let's just keep going. Number five is this. And and I think that this is a convicting thing, but so good. Don't try to force God to speak to you. 
Don't try to force him to speak to you. We don't come to him with the posture of a beggar. We don't come to him like, please, God, say something now, or here's my ultimatum. If you don't speak to me now, I'm doing this. Because God doesn't work in terms of ultimatums. His goodness is not determined by your ability to force him to be good. Like, he's been good to you whether you can see his goodness or not. He was good to Job when he took everything from Job. His goodness was still being realized in Job's life. And so don't try to force God. The best way to get new information from God is to be obedient on the information he already gave you. So God, give me a word. God's like, I totally did. And as soon as you're obedient to that, I'll give you new information. <laughs> it's, I'll put it like this. Like, in, in, <laughs> if God was a GPS, he doesn't give you every twist and turn until you actually make the one that's prescribed for you. And then it'll say, you know how like when you're driving, it'll say, okay, in 3.8 mile, miles, go to exit 38. Then you go to exit 38, gives you the next new information. God's plan for your life and his voice in your life is released as you are in motion, making the turns that he's prescribing. And so if you allow yourself to actually just do what he told you to do, as a matter of fact, like when I think about hearing God's voice, I remember God told me, go to New York, serve those people of Hurricane Sandy. Then I went home. He said, sell your house, sell everything, go back. Then I went back. Then it's like every step of my journey has been more like a sequential GPS than it has been charting the map and knowing the whole thing from the beginning. And so be obedient to old information to get new information. That's how you hear God's voice. So right now you can do an exercise before you even take a step further. Think about what God has already told you that you currently are sitting on. Think about what God already spoke in your life and then ask yourself, what can I do right now after this sermon is over to be obedient to it? And then I guarantee you, God will speak the next thing. All right. So here's the next one. Number, number six, God communicates through many forms, but often uses your mind. God communicates through many forms, but often uses your mind. What does that mean? It means that if you're maybe immature or new believer, like you're just starting out, when you hear people say, God spoke to me, you may think that they heard an audible voice. Like, God is saying to you now, (laughs) you know? And then you're like, I don't understand because I was walking down the street and God didn't audibly speak to me, so maybe I'm not special. But the reality is God often uses your mind, okay? So if you just understand that, you can think about this, and this is kind of the bigger revelation. Philippians chapter four, verse eight says this, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why? Why do we have this command to think on those things? Because those are the things that partner with the voice of God in our mind. So what it's saying is don't build a thought life that doesn't sound like God's nature. Don't build a thought life in your mind that your voice is going to constantly be in competition of the culture of God's voice. So he's saying, think on these things because those things become a catalyst for hearing the voice of God because they're like the language he uses. So when God talks about things, he's talking about what is right, what is noble, what is pure, what's lovely, what's admirable, what's excellent or praiseworthy. These are the things, these are the materials by which he forms the words that he speaks to you. So think in thoughts that are, and so here's what Paul says, I take captive every thought that erects itself up against the word of God. I pull down. I'm mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is he saying? What he's saying is I won't build two kingdoms in my mind. I'll actually build the kingdom of heaven in my mind and I'll destroy everything else. Every building brick by brick, every thought that's being built, that's erecting itself up against what God says, because you can't have two kingdoms in your mind. And so the next one is this number seven. It's just like flowing right into it. Renew your mind to hear God's voice. Renew your mind to hear God's voice. What does that mean? It means, see, God's voice, and this is like kind of for everyone who's leaning in right now, please follow me. God's voice is redemptive, not just corrective. 
So what does this mean? When God's truly speaking, he's going to speak a redemptive word. He's going to try to redeem a situation, redeem a person. But when you want to hear God's voice just to throttle someone, just to correct somebody, just to break them down, you don't think like your, your mind's not renewed. You know, when you go to give someone a word like God said this thing, or is that a redemptive word or a corrective word? In other words, do you see the, the version on the other side of this word of a person actually being successful, actually crushing it in life, winning? Or are you just speaking that word because you don't like them and you're actually cooperating more with the accuser? See, the devil is referred to in the Bible as the accuser of the brethren. So do your prophetic words sound more like the accuser or the redeemer? And that's something because I know a lot of Christians, oh, I heard from God and you need to hear this. And I'm like, actually, you're, that word's not redemptive. It's more corrective. In other words, you're accusing someone. You're not helping them be redeemed by Christ. And so filter it through that. Filter it through that. And so you have to renew your mind. Number eight. Number eight. Interpret the written word of God with the living word of God. What does that mean? I love this. It's such a great promise. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. How many things will he teach you? All All things. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. So you read the written word with the living word inside of you. So that's why, and for those of you who are listening, again, if you're new to the faith, you might be like, I don't understand how people read the Bible and get their mind blown. I don't understand why people, it's because they're not reading it just with their own mind. They're reading the written word with the living word inside of them. In other words, the Holy Spirit is interpreting it with them and for them. It's a powerful experience. That's why you can't say as a Christian, well, I don't get anything when I read the word. I dare you. I dare you to say, Holy Spirit, you are the living word inside of me. Interpret the written word on the page and then tell me what happens and read Leviticus. (laughs) You know, so that's, that's a big thing. And and this kind of goes to my, again, this is flowing sequentially in order. Number nine is this learn God's character, learn God's character in order to discern his voice. So I have made it a regular habit of my life to read the Bible all the way through. And as you read the Bible, you begin to familiarize yourself with the character of God. Okay, And as you familiarize yourself with the character of God, it's just like this. People who hang with Mike Signorelli enough, they, they begin to get these parameters about what they expect me to do and not to do. They get this behavioral norm. They get this benchmark for activity in my life. And if you were to tell them Mike Signorelli did this and they know me well enough, they would be, be able to discern that what you're saying is a lie because they'll say, that's not like him. That's not like him. You, don't, you must not know him. Okay, and so when you read the word of God, you begin to learn his character and discern his voice. So when something comes to you and you're trying to say, is that God or not? You'll say, well, here's a good template. He talked the same way to Joshua that he's talking to me right now. He talked the same way to Nehemiah as he's talking to me. Oh, yeah. When he talked to Moses, that sounds like the character of God. The way that he talked to them is in line with how he's talking to me, which is why one of the best things you can do is learn his character to discern his voice voice. And then number 10 is this, the last one about how to hear God's voice. And I know this has been very meaty. I know that there's been a lot to this. This has been been like a very dense, packed word, but I believe that you're being equipped because we're living in these times where hearing God's voice is no longer just some like bonus to the Christian experience. This is now an essential, fundamental element of surviving in 2020. This is in the 21st century. It's not an option anymore. And and consider yourself, and I don't know who this is for, uh, but consider yourself blessed that you get to see these times. I mean, like the question I'm asking you is, what does God think about you that he actually preordains your birth to be the day and the time that it was so that you would see these times? What, it, what does God think and believe about you that you are here in the 21st century to actually expand his work on the earth? Like, why are you here? Which leads me to number 10. The final way that I'm prescribing to you to hear God's voice is to set aside time to intentionally listen. 
Set aside time to intentionally listen to his voice. When you look at the life of Jesus here on planet Earth, he, he made it a habit of waking up early every single day and he would go apart. And you know, it's funny because you probably are saying, well, man, Jesus in a way had it made because there was not the noise of the wind of social media. There wasn't the noise of the earthquake of the news, the 24 hour news cycle constantly bombarding our lives with fear. There wasn't the fire of seeing the circumstances of our lives continually go up in flames as we lose a job, lose a romantic partner. But you have to distance yourself from all of that noise to intentionally set aside time to hear from his voice. And Jesus modeled this. It was an expectation in the lives of the disciples that when they would wake up, they would say, we already know the character of Jesus. He's up before we're up. And he just got done praying probably for hours. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that before daybreak, he was up, which meant that according to Jewish culture, that probably would put him approximately around 3 a.m. wake up time. And, the, and think about what's happening at 3 a.m. But he knew, and this is, this is why the disciples, the, the only question that we have recorded in Scripture that they asked Jesus, teach me how to do, wasn't the signs, miracles, and wonders. It probably would have been the thing that I asked him how to do. It wasn't, hey, make me a better preacher. It wasn't even, make me a prophet. You know what they asked him? Teach me how to pray. Teach me the discipline of intentionally setting aside time to hear God's voice because they fundamentally understood that every sign, miracle, and wonder, every sermon he ever preached, everything that he ever did was flowing from that place. And so I want you to think about the way that this is like your survival tactic in the 21st century is get yourself set aside from all the noise and intentionally hear his voice. And I want to do something right now, as a matter of fact. You know, I had this phenomenon where my wife, a couple of weeks ago, unfortunately, was in a car accident. And it was like one of those T-bone experiences. The other car was completely totaled. And do you know that my wife thought to call me before the police? I got one of those frantic phone calls that you dread as a husband. And you say, oh man, I, like, it's what happened and, and how bad is it? One of those immediate, your stomach drops. And Julie's frantic. She's like, Mike, Mike, I've just been in an accident. I'm right down the street. Please come. And I'm like, where are you, Jules? Where are you? And I'm, I'm telling Bella, you know, hey, you know, watch Everly. And I run out of the house and I'm, I'm running towards, you know, this, the uncertainty of, of, of this situation. And I, I walk up to the situation and my wife was bruised up pretty bad, uh, but that was about the extent of it. And the other guy um, had a broken hand, but was okay. But, but here's the thing, you know, we're in these volatile situations in life where things can change almost immediately. And what I, what I do as a man of God is I wake up and I establish myself with God in prayer. And then it's from that place that I move forward into the void, into the darkness, into the uncertainty. You know, just 24, 48 hours ago, this country looked completely different. And just in a series of days, you can watch the NBA and Disney and Universal Studios and everything shut down. You have entire school systems shutting down in Ohio and Michigan and probably more. And it's like, if if we've learned anything, we know that things can change rapidly, but it's, it's getting into the presence of God and, and starting from that place and saying, I'm going to establish myself in his voice. And then that's going to guide me. See what Julie didn't know before she called me frantically is that the Holy Spirit had already, already spoken to me that morning and said, Michael, I give you my peace today. And so what, and so as I was, oh man, as I was running down the street, with the uncertainty of whether or not my wife was where, what she, where she was physically, I was running down the street with the peace of God guarding my mind as I run towards that situation. And that's what's gonna continue to guard you is that peace of God in that time. So I wanna do this right now. And, and today we had made a commitment that we are gonna stand in solidarity as we watch and say that we went from a three campus church, a three location church to a 1,000 location church. Amen. And so what I want you to do is I believe that there's a thousand V1 locations and I believe that God has foreordained that this sermon, that this worship experience would resound in homes and colleges and locations all around the world. And, and I believe that God wants to speak to you. So I want to do something. I want to just take the next 30 seconds of 
of silence. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you now, to give you a word. As a matter of fact, I want you to comment underneath this video, and I want you to tell me what God told you in this next 30 seconds. Are you ready? Go. Heavenly Father, we are a world in desperate need of your voice. Yes, it's comforting to hear the voice of preachers and politicians and teachers and people we trust, but God, we are placing 100% of our trust in your voice. And Father, I believe that in your divine plan, you've got a thousand V1 locations that are leaning into your voice right now. Satellites that are picking up a signal from a distant place where there's unspeakable joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, I pray that your kingdom come, your will be done right in our homes as it is in heaven, right in our families as it is in heaven. Father, I prophesy that every person that's listening right now would come into the safety of your voice, that whole families would be saved, that there's people that, that came into the living room and saw this message and were provoked to say, I need God's voice in my life too. And Father, I pray that they would hear right now that you're responding to them tangibly through this message saying, I love you. I have always loved you. And I have a purpose for you through the midst of this storm. And Father, I just thank you for destiny appointments, for all the testimonies as the result of this service, for all the healings that are taking place place in physical bodies right now, Father, and all the words that are being spoken and released. And Father, I thank you for that 30 seconds where every single one of us got a word from you. And I pray that your word would begin to saturate every feed, every comment section, every Twitter feed, every social media, every text message, Father, that we would have a counterbalance where there's been this theme of fear that your words would be released through your people as a mighty flood to to begin to fill every single feed as a counter response to the lies of the enemy in the ears of God's people. And Father, I believe it. And, and with that church across a thousand locations, we all say, Amen. Amen.